Welcome to the Texas A&M University College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences Peer Programs STEM Education Series. Today, Dr. Gary Adams will present Hitting the Mark, Precision Medicine in Humans and Animals. What if, when you went to visit the doctor, he or she didn't say, now stick out your tongue and say ah, but rather, let's have a look at your genome. What if the medicine prescribed was developed specifically for you? What if you began treatment for a disease you wouldn't develop until you were 40, the moment you were born? This may all sound like science fiction. However, this type of precision medicine is happening now. Dr. Adams today will define precision medicine for us, tell us where we currently are, and what the future may hold. Welcome, Dr. Adams. Well, thank you very much. We have a fantastic subject today, one that involves us personally, or our animals personally and particularly. So precision medicine, we'll discuss it. Sometimes it's called personalized medicine. One thing interesting about it, it involves a lot of information, as you'll see on the, on the screen now, genomic medicine, personal medicine, bringing together health and a lot of information to a focal point for precision treatment. You'll see the syringes in, intersecting there with the target. That's to make the treatment much more specific, and we'll show a little more detail on how that's done. Does this apply to animals as well as people? Well, yes, it does, very much so. We're at the very beginning of personalized medicine or precision medicine. It began actually back in 2003 and 2004, but we're still in the initial stages of perfecting personalized medicine, but it will impact us more and more. What is it about? Well, it's about disease treatment and prevention that's specific for a particular disease condition, trait, or some kind of an issue that involves the body at some level, so that each gene involved in the specific environment or the specific lifestyle for each of us individually is taken into account. So it's layers and layers of data that are brought together. And that's why we're still about midway through developing personalized or precision medicine applications. It's more about treating the individual person, you or me specifically, or our animal specifically, tailored, you might say, to our condition. Whatever that is, it's threatening our health. It has been said by some scientists, and I tend to agree with this myself, that precision medicine will be more revolutionary than antibiotics were in medicine and health. Now that's quite an outstanding statement to make, that it will revolutionize human and animal health as much as antibiotics. It's probably true, and let us show you why. Usually there are around three to four million differences that we have in each of us individually, you versus me, at least four million differences. And a lot of that is determined by, yes, by our genome, but by the environment, by our lifestyle, and the personal work area that we, where we live, the area we work, the kind of environment we're involved with. All of those are specific traits or conditions that's related to us individually. And that's what personalized medicine or precision medicine is about. I mentioned that it began in earnest with the genomic era of uh, medicine when the first human genome was sequenced. And we'll chat about that a little bit more later. But the idea of personalized medicine is not that new because blood transfusions, as you well know, need to have specific matching of the blood donor to the blood recipient. And so that's a form of personalized medicine. Another one is an insulin pumps that must be tailored to that individual's needs. Those are kind of examples that you can wrap your mind around because that these need to be specific for how much insulin is needed or the specific blood type that's required for your transfusion. So that's the idea, but now the idea is spun up much, much higher by, with the advent of the genome, uh, human genome that's been done, and we'll chat about that, as I mentioned a little later. The overall idea before in medicine and veterinary medicine is that one size fits all, that idea, that concept. 
So if we look at the individuals on the left side of the screen, you'll see there are um, differences in those individuals. We mentioned a while ago somewhere between three and five million differences at least. So when one prescription, let's say one treatment, is given to this diverse population, in part of them there, will be an ad there could be an adverse reaction and sometimes even fatal. So a kind of reaction we would not want uh, to receive us individually or our animals. In some of the individuals, there will actually be no benefit. It will neither harm nor help the medical condition that we're facing. But in others, yes, it'll be beneficial. So it's represented here by 33% to each one of that in that distribution. This is not what actually occurs, but the idea here is that one size fits all may not be the best approach for treatments or for prevention of disease conditions. So what's happened, and this is more likely the case now, is that stratified medicine is the approach now. And that takes into consideration a lot of factors. Uh, it says there's a list there of disease phenotype, risk profile, your demographics, socioeconomic profile, and so on, including biomarkers. I want to touch on that one. And uh, the subpopulations that we live in. All of those impact the response that we will have to a treatment, whether it's a drug or whether it's some other, it's a surgical intervention and uh, whatever the treatment course would be. So precision medicine, the whole concept here, is to try to ensure, we say ensures here, and I, I think in the future it will, right now it's may ensure delivery of the right intervention, the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. So we want to have that precision or personalized type of treatment. That's the idea. So as we move across to precision medicine, we can see now uh, you see a list of uh, patient traits, and it begins with the genome and the omics, and we'll touch on omics a bit more later. I already mentioned lifestyle, preferences, health history, do you have a history of prior exposure, are you an asthmatic, and those kind of conditions that are in your medical records. That information will be brought to bear on precision medicine to tailor these treatment to be specific for you. And so you see a diagram of all the uh, conditions, the heart, lung, and so on in the body. But that then is combined with a diagnostic and the treatment and the diagnostic brought together by the genomic information. Then you'll see individual drugs tailored to individuals who need that drug and that specific treatment at the specific time. So a, uh, those groups now are divided rather than one drug treating all three groups. Now each patient benefits from having a specific treatment for a specific condition at a specific time. So let's, let's look at this in a little more detail. I mentioned that individual needs determine the precision medicine. And uh, this means we have to build very strong algorithms to analyze all the data on us individually. We would start with our genome and then all the clinical history that we have from the time we were born until the time that the condition occurs. All of that has to be brought to get together and then analyze with um, very, very uh, advanced type of analysis to understand the data. I uh, mentioned the genome, that's our DNA that's been extracted and each of the bases within the DNA are sequenced one at a time so the entire stretch of the genome is, is known and can be determined. Also pharmacogenomics, proteomic data means the analysis of the proteins in samples that would be collected from us individually or from an animal so that we would know the genes and how they're expressed and the proteins that are made from those genes, we would have a profile of the proteins that are made. The microbiota, you'll hear more and more about the microbiome these days. It's becoming much more um, a part of our health and wellness. And so knowing the microbiota, your own specific microbiota, would tailor, would impact the response to medical interventions. And uh, uh, here's a metabolome or metabolomic profile that we would have, and then the environment we live in. Do we work in an environment that's a... Um, Let's say we're living in an area where there's heavy smog and air pollution and contamination. 
versus in an area where we live in maybe West Texas where there's a lot of dust. So all of those conditions would be brought into the algorithm to analyze the data to try to identify the most beneficial treatment. So that's making it individualized, personalized, and precise. This is the idea I want you to capture. I have a you question might, for you, Dr. Yes. Adams, I'm going to interrupt you here. You did mention quite a bit of data there, and our students would like to know how long does it take to obtain that much data? Well, right now that's a slow process, uh, but it's not that slow. The genome can be done in a matter of days now. Your entire genome can be done in a matter of days. It used to cost, the first one was millions and millions of dollars. Now it can be done for somewhere between $100 and $250. So cost was a major factor. That's no longer a factor. That's taken out of the equation. But your medical histories, as you go to the doctor these days or your animal comes in to a veterinarian for treatment, Medical records are accumulated from the first time you visit. Those are being documented over time. So that information is now being cataloged. And what's, um, what speeded this up, it's not where it needs to be, but we're on our way there, is the software to analyze the data. And we'll talk about the, um, the approaches that we can use there to understand the data. Because some of these could be, it would completely fill your computer terabytes and terabytes of data. That is a lot of information. But the ability to understand the data now is what is made in, what's really transformed the probability of having personalized medicine in a not too distant future. We already have personalized medicine at a lower level. It will increase over time and part of that, you mentioned data, is the ability to understand the data. So accumulating it, that's a lifetime because as your medical records accumulate, tests are done on you, blood samples are taken, that's all being accumulated and that would go into your data set. And that's sort of explained in this image you'll see on the screen now on the lower left. I think all of you are in, very aware of Google Maps. But Google Maps, you see, are made of multiple layers. You see from transportation to an image of the actual site, the postal code and so on. I won't read all those to you, but you'll see that the Google Maps have multiple layers of information. Well, that's the same type of algorithm or approach that will be used for personalized data and personalized medicine and precision medicine. You'll see that it goes all the way from starting at the bottom with you as the individual. That's a focal point where it begins. And then each of the layers, I mentioned the microbiome, I mentioned the genome, the signs and symptoms, your medical records, and then episome is what you've been exposed to and the genes that are presented. So those layers come together in a focal point focused on us individually. That's how we get to personalized our precision medicine. That's the idea. So processing the data. That was a very good question, exactly the question I need to lead into the next topic, and that's how do we understand it? And I mentioned that we have much better software now to begin to understand the data. We're still not at the level we need to be, but we're approaching it better and better. And one of those is systems biology. And what does that mean? That means bringing in all parts of the system into a focal point. Because as we interact with the environment, it's a biological system of our bodies interacting with the biological system of the environment. Or the biological system of a pathogen, let's say we encounter influenza virus. That virus has its own biological system, we have our biology, and as those interact, that generates a series of uh, information that can be analyzed. And that's analyzed by artificial intelligence and machine learning. A pattern is developed, a normal pattern. Normally, this is how you breathe, how your heart beats, your temperature, the kind of perspiration you have. The, your whole makeup is a normal set of parameters. Against that, then, is if the system is perturbed, your biological system, you, your health, is perturbed by some infection or some toxin or some in event. Everything is, um, all of the bio your biological system will begin to respond to the environment. And that's what can be used using artificial intelligent machine uh, language, machine learning, that is, 
to compare the patterns of health versus um, the time where there's illness. Then you can make a deduction of this person's ability to respond and what kind of drug or treatment can be used. So you'll see the diagram on the right. This is a circular, it, 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 there's iteration after iteration after iteration where data are collected and how much data is it and how long does it take depends on when our system is perturbed and how that information can be uh, collected. So I have experiment there, actually that could be your health condition. That's analyzed, it's modeled in the computer models and tested and then that's recollected and recycled. So as it cycles, it becomes more and more precise. It becomes better and better. If you're challenged with salmonella, bacterium, or you're challenged with the virus, the body will respond in a certain way. And if the body responds in an appropriate way, that means you probably won't need any treatment. If it doesn't, that means you might need a specific treatment, say to interfere with the virus or to treat the body so that it responds more appropriately to clear the virus. So I hope you're getting the idea about multiple systems of information coming together. Some metadata, as it's called, and that would be your clinical signs and symptoms that are collected by your physician or by your veterinarian over time that's fed into your uh, history, clinical history, and database. So I hope you're getting that idea. You see, I mentioned omics a while ago in a presentation, and maybe you're familiar with that. If you're not, you see all of those um, on the right-hand side, you'll see data acquisition. So there's a genome, transcriptome, proteome, interactome, metabolome. You see all those ohms, O-M-E's? All of those collectively come together in an omics analysis. So I hope you're getting the idea that large data, huge analysis, and then how do we understand it? So the idea here is uh, of precision medicine, personalized medicine, is to be able to predict rather than react. Can we use predictive biology in a, in a positive way for better health? That's the idea. And we've already mentioned the algorithms on how to digest, you might say, all of these data to come to a conclusion within a subpopulation of individuals, let's say in a village, all the way down to us as an individual or animal as an individual. I have I, another question for you. Yes. Uh -huh. I'd like to know who or what type of person is going to be able to develop these algorithms and um, processes, programs to analyze the data. Is, are you going to have to have a computer engineer with a medical degree or um, is this a doctor who can do this? You know, that's an excellent question. That, that probably the whole uh, lecture today could be tailored right around that idea. It's going to be you. Uh, I hope you are sitting out there and you're being, um, let's say, stimulated by this and challenged by this because this is the future. So yes, it will take uh, all of those. It'll take genomicists and geneticists. It will take physicians. It will take mathematicians. It will take computer scientists. The uh, analytical methods I just informed you about, machine learning and uh, algorithms, it will take people who can think about the idea of how to uh, uh, analyze these data, digest these data from a mathematical computing point of view. It will also take those who understand medicine from a health point of view to come together and have a conversation. And we've done that in our own laboratory. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. In our own group, we have bacteriologists, pathologists, geneticists, electrical engineers, computer scientists, statisticians, and I could go on, uh, proteomists, and so on, uh, bioinformaticists, to come together to try to understand these data. But the reason for the lecture today is to stimulate your interest in precision medicine for the future. And so maybe we're coming through a bit on that. I appreciate the question. You're right on target. And so it's all of you would bring your backgrounds, your experience, it will take a lot of intention and hard studies to move this forward, but it can be done. It is being done, but we're not where we need to be, and we need for you to get on board to help us. So analyzing the disease, here's an example right here. I, I want to give you three or four examples of where um, 
Precision medicine is being used now and will only get better. So here's an example where a, a biopsy, a liquid biopsy, that is blood is collected. You've probably had blood collected. And in this case, there is cell-free DNA floating around in our bloodstream. And that's come from some tumor or neoplasm, a uh, cancer somewhere that's leaking into the bloodstream. That can be collected, the DNA analy uh, extracted and analyzed. There are a couple of methods that are seen there. One is analysis by PCR. You've probably heard of pol polymerase chain reaction, a way to amplify the DNA. There's not much DNA floating around out there. Another way is to collect the DNA and actually sequence it. The genome, as we've already mentioned, is all of the DNA in our body is sequenced from beginning to end. So when it's sequenced, that can be matched to a part of the genome in our body. And if that DNA is modified in some way that is specific to a tumor, some cancer, then we have a diagnosis. We have a diagnosis of specifically what that tumor is. So here's one way that we can use precision medicine approach to analyze the data to come to a specific diagnostic. So I mentioned DNA of infectious microbes. Yes, if that DNA is in the bloodstream, we can amplify it or sequence it or amplify it and sequence it and determine which organism is in your body, has challenged your system, so, uh, and, and detect tumors, as we've already mentioned. So there's one example. So who will it take? And you've already uh, preempted this with a great question. Thank you for asking that question. And here is a partial list. This is only... This is only partial. So you see physicians, pathologists, microbiologists, geneticists, um, computational uh, scientists, even veterinarians working in this area like myself. So it would be a team approach. Um, you might think that in, in uh, earlier times it was one scientist in the laboratory, usually by himself, maybe with some students working on a problem. That still occurs, but more and more we're seeing that the team research approach, because you bring the expertise from multiple uh, scientists together on a focal point, in this case, it's precision medicine, personalized medicine, <clears throat> how to get to the level of the individual, to tailor the treatment specifically to that individual, optimize the treatment to make it much more effective. So, is how soon is this going to occur? I've told you we're probably about in the middle of it, but all of us are involved in this, every one of us. And the reason I say that is because we have a precision medicine initiative that was uh, began by President Barack Obama in 2015. He invested uh, $225 million of taxpayers' funds in precision medicine in this initiative which was a phenomenal step forward. We need to go much more forward than this. We'll need a lot more funding to move this out to the level that it needs to be. And the idea was to collect genetic data, that is sequence, and collect the health information, those records that we talked to, medical records we talked about, on one million individuals. So if we go from coast to coast, north to south, through all of the, as many environmental conditions we can, and one million individuals, and that could be some of you even volunteering, to be some of those individuals who would um, donate their DNA and their medical history to this precision medicine initiative. That level and that scope of activity is what it's going to take to move precision medicine up one more notch uh, to a higher level to make it more of a reality than it is now. It is a reality, but it's a beginning of the reality. There's a lot of promise in precision medicine, and not all of it's been realized, because it will take uh, future scientists like you to um, provide your input and to move this concept forward. Here are three or four more examples that I wanted to show you where personalized medicine can be applied. I'm gonna prompt you with a question, and I know these slides are going to answer it a little bit, but I think it's an important question. And they would like to know the, um, well, they start with, you mentioned that there are three to four million differences in individual genomes. So given that, do scientists actually understand enough of our genome to tailor medicine to specific diseases? Great question. You're right on target. In fact, you're ahead of me, and that's great. 
I think you already know about precision medicine and personalized medicine. Those questions make me think you already understand this, and maybe I'm, I'm um, being a little too basic on this. But do we understand enough? No. We need more talent. We need more application. We need more resources, and some of that is the funding. You mentioned, I just mentioned a $215 million investment by President Obama. That needs to continue and be amplified. Here's what I can say is, now with the genome of the individual, maybe some of you submitted your DNA to uh, private companies who sequence DNA to determine your ancestry or have um, an idea about your ancestry, at least explore your ancestry. Well, there's a beginning where you can see your genetic background, your ethnic background, is being analyzed now at the genomic level. So there's a direct application of, uh, from the, uh, the human genome and animal genomes uh, about the origin, your origin, your genetic ethnic origin. And that plays into and feeds into and strengthens the possibility of uh, predicting you may have a susceptibility to some condition. Some people have a genetic susceptibility to malaria. That can now be predicted. So that I, if I had that genetic susceptibility, I would avoid going into zones of the world where malaria is common, and there are lots of those. So there's an idea of, do we understand enough? No. Do we understand enough to begin? Yes. We definitely understand enough to begin and build better and better and better rationales, these algorithms, machine learning, artificial intelligence, to learn what those data mean from the genome. Hopefully that answers your question. And we can use these examples. I'll just touch on these briefly. Most of you have heard of cystic fibrosis, a, a lethal disease in humans. And it's caused by a mutation in a specific gene. It's a gene that controls a, 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 a chloride channel in the epithelium, the bronchial epithelium of the lung, so that the, the chloride cannot be pumped out. And so there's a mutation there. Is there any way that we can interfere with that or change that, open the channel so the chloride can go out. Well, yes, there is. And there are multiple approaches on that. They are used now to treat individuals who have this genetic condition, determined again off of the genome of the person. And this can now be treated effectively to prolong the life of those individuals with cystic fibrosis by interfering with the deficient gene, the mutated gene, and opening that chloride channel so the chlorine can move out, the chloride uh, ion can move out, and then again through the mucus layer that lines our, our bronchial uh, tree. So that then the um, normal function of the epithelium, which has beating cilia on it, to move the mucus up when you cough so that you can eliminate that. So here's one application where precision medicine has been used based off the genome, a major, this is a huge finding and a step forward for the application of precision medicine. There's another case, and this is associated with conditions of the cardiovascular system, atherosclerosis and accumulation of plaques in vessels. And this is related to too much uh, lipid circulating in the blood. And there's a, and there's an inheritance, a familial inheritance of this particular gene, PCSK9, which is associated to receptor. And if the, um, this receptor is blocked by this particular gene product, uh, then the lipid accumulates in the blood and is deposited in vessels, and blood vessels, particularly those in the heart, coronary vessels in particular. And so then there's a clot forms, and then there's a myocardial infarction. In those cases, most of the time, the hyperlipidemia can be treated by other methods. But in those of us who are predisposed by this particular genetic mutation, that can now be treated with a monoclonal antibody specifically to block the effects of this particular gene, allow the receptor to uh, accept the high, uh, low-density lipoproteins, process those, and lower the amount of fat or lipids circulating in the blood. Another application of precision medicine. And there are lots more, and I'll touch on one more, and that's related to uh, non-small cell lung cancer. 
associated with the epidermal growth factor uh, receptor. And we'll chat on that just a little bit because it's so important. I mentioned here that um, lung cancer, uh, more people die of lung cancer than colon, breast, and prostate cancer combined. One in four cancer deaths are caused by lung cancer. So that means it's an extremely important condition. What can we do about it? Is there anything we can use uh, and apply precision medicine? Well, yes, there is. As I mentioned, it's an epidermal growth factor receptor. You'll see it there, EGFR. That receptor occurs much more frequently on cancer cells, um, 10 times more than it should. And why is that important? Because when it binds with its particular um, ligand that it binds to, the, the object that it binds, it triggers the cell to grow faster, grow more, grow out of control. So if there's a way to interfere with this receptor, impact that receptor will reduce the rate of growth of those tumors. And so that has been done. I mentioned uh, there are uh, multiple mutations in those cancer cells, but one of those is the epidermal growth factor receptor is a major one because when it's triggered and if there's a saturation on the surface of these receptors, it tells the cell to keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. And that ends up being in cancer. And if that can be interfered with, and it can be by antibody treatment, monoclonal antibody treatment, specifically against that receptor, we can reduce the rate and the growth of those tumors and help the treatment of people. It doesn't treat all, not all of the um, lung cancer, adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas have this increased density, but those that do can be treated with the monoclonal antibody. That particular mutation has been uh, mapped to chromosome seven. I just show you an example where it's mapped in the human, um, in the human genome on uh, chromosome seven and where it's located. Just to, to link, again, going back to the human genome, we had, we, the question was asked, do we have enough information to understand it? We're beginning to have more and more information. And cases like this one, a diseases or condition like this one, gives us a lot of hope that we can understand more and more and that we can apply methods to either block the particular protein that's expressed epidermal growth factor receptor with an antibody or mutate it with new technology now to um, change it, to adapt it, to replace it. That's becoming much more uh, effective now. So targeted treatment of specific mutations is becoming much, much more effective. There's some new technology out, newer technology called CRISPR-Cas9, and that allows gene editing. And one day, I think you will see, as a consequence of precision medicine, the use of this gene editing to improve the health of the individual who has these particular defects. So these are some examples in human medicine. Do they apply to veterinary medicine? Well, yes, of course they do. And we have the advantage of uh, subpopulations or um, subgroups in that we have breeds of dogs uh, that and cattle and sheep and horses where we can focus on the genomic structure and all of these sequence these animals have been sequenced we have genomic sequences on many of the domestic animal species all the domestic animal species actually now and we can begin to understand it in those conditions where there's a mutation and we've found some of those I, I mentioned animal husbandry can we increase the yield by selecting specific sets of genes that control traits like feed conversion or growth or health or coat color, multiple factors. Yes, we're getting better and better at that. We're not where we need to be, but we're making excellent progress on that. These diseases in animals um, can be used for uh, understanding human disease. And there are lots of applications of those in cancer and in other medical conditions. The last one I'll just touch on is a good example where there's multi-drug resistance gene one. And the interaction of this particular gene, a mutation, that if your dog were to be treated with ivermectin, an antiparasitic drug, anthelminic, 
or with a tranquilizer, ACE promazine, or with a pain medication, butorphanol, the animal will not be able to process those compounds. And the MDR uh, mutation, multidrug resistant gene one, um, would not allow processing. So they accumulate and cause central nervous system disturbances. And they're mostly seen in collies or dogs, which uh, usually herding dogs like uh, border collies and other breeds of dogs that are used to herd livestock. And for some reason, I go back up to, we have purebred, and here's an example where analysis of the purebred collies reveal this uh, mutation in multidrug resistant gene one and the inability to process these and about eight other compounds and such that they accumulate in the central nervous system or brain of the animal and cause clinical disease. So precision medicine, personalized medicine, um, individual treatment, yes. So that would mean you would use these drugs in these kinds of dogs, particularly if you had already done an analysis. We mentioned PCR a while ago, collecting DNA, do a PCR sequence, and you would know whether your animal, your collie, or another um, herding animal, herding dog, would have this mutation. Therefore, you would not use any of these compounds. So there's a, um, an idea of how personalized and precision medicine can be applied in veterinary medicine as well as in human medicine. So I'm wanting you to get the idea and to grasp the idea that precision medicine is here now and it's going to really become more and more applied in medicine. And there are I've a lot got, of reasons. I've got another question I okay. want to interrupt you here. So you've given us some great examples of the benefits to this precision medicine and our student would like to know what could be some of the negative effects of genetic tamp tampering? <clears throat> well, this, uh, again, uh, superb question because um, all biological effects, whether it's an antibiotic or surgical invention, there are always trade-offs and there could be side effects and um, reasons why this technology would not be useful. And uh, this goes back to the other question is, do we know enough to apply it? Do, can we understand the genome or the proteome or the microbiome well enough to actually apply it? And this question is related to, are there detrimental effects to this? Well, yes, there can be nearly every medication known has some side effect. We go back to that, about the third slide where we saw those nine individuals. Three had an adverse effect, three had no effect, and three had a beneficial effect. So we need to know more and more about the genome in order to avoid the adverse effects. If, we're, if there's going to be gene editing in humans, yet to be determined, it's been done in animals, in mice, and in cattle, and it was effective. Whether that's going to be allowed or whether that's going to occur, one of the uh, issues with this are what are the side effects? What are the downside of this? Will this be permanent? Will that person who's had gene editing, should that ever occur? Will that be permanent? Will that be carried off into the next generation and their offspring? And those are questions where, again, we're wanting to involve you to become part of the solution. Yes, that's a problem, to answer your question precisely. Yes, that could be a problem. And yes, we need to know more. And yes, we need, well, I hope that I'm recruiting you to become a part of the solution. Uh, I've heard someone say, uh, love the problem to actually begin to be able to solve it, to, to move toward a solution. If you love the problem well enough, you'll begin to understand it and move toward a solution. So this is still about halfway through the generation of precision medicine or personalized medicine as we know it now. Remember I said, I said that uh, the molecular basis for personalized medicine was proposed in 2003 and 2004 by some really, really fine scientists. Uh, they were even a bit ridiculed about that because it said we could predict from the genome what will happen when this person is exposed to an environment or chalice. And so that idea was um, a bit premature, 
but the idea was still planted. It's still a good idea. So new frontiers, pharmacogenomics. This is understanding the genetic basis for response to drugs. I go back to that um, illustration we had at the beginning. Three individuals had adverse effects. They were harmed by the treatment. Three had no benefit and three had um, beneficial responses. How can we understand that better? And part of it is understanding the genome and uh, how drugs interact with our bodies. And can we predict that? We probably will be. That's still a science. It's under development. But again, that's going to be an excellent application. In order that we can, uh, if I take one drug, you take another, I have beneficial effect, you have an adverse effect, the genomic basis for those differences will be understood more and more as we study the genome. And in particularly in those individuals who have an adverse effect, those who have a beneficial effect. Will we be able to predict that? Yes, that's called predictive biology. And it's called also using computational biology, systems level biology. And I go back to artificial intelligence, machine learning, into an algorithm, into a computational algorithm to understand how the uh, drug causes side effects or benefits. New frontiers, I've already mentioned omics, and there are a lot more of those. I think there were about five or six on the side of that figure that we looked at, genomics, interactome, proteome, transcriptome, and here we are, pharmacoproteomics, toxicoproteomics, more and more of the omics the study of the whole family of proteins, the study of all of the genes that are expressed, transcriptome, is more and more complete every day. A every day, and the data are being accumulated at a high rate. Oncology, tumor, studying tumors, and we've already, I showed you some examples of where, when we know the genetic basis for the molecular defect, that can be treated either with some interruption, like a monoclonal antibody that neutralizes that protein, or by editing that gene, or by some other approach is already occurring. And, and we showed you examples of, um, of uh, lung cancer and how many people are dying from it. Disease prediction, we chatted a little bit about uh, malaria is one example, where some individuals already have a genetic defect that makes them very susceptible to malaria. And so we would not, if the person's genome was analyzed, they would know that I'm susceptible to malaria and other viral diseases and bacterial diseases, such as salmonella. So can we do that? To some degree now, but we're still at an early stage and a lot more work to be done. We've done some work ourselves in our own laboratories with regard using the precision medicine, personalized medicine concept to understand a disease called salmonellosis, caused by salmonella, a uh, pathogen that's very, very frequent, the most frequent cause of uh, diarrhea in people and in animals, and it can be lethal. So we studied it in the intestines of the calf, and where I show the arrow there is where the organism enters, it grows in the epithelium, and you'll see this really complicated map in the center, that center figure. That represents all the genes in the calf that interacted with all the genes in the salmonella pathogen. So there was a possibility of 20,000, up to 20,000 genes in the calf interacting with around 4,300 genes in salmonella. This puts that together into a map. Now, you can't understand it by looking at this, but what it shows is gene-to-gene -gene interaction. And I show two molecules that interact, and when they do, they combine to cause the animal to have more disease. So I show the sick calves over there on the right and, and a lesion in the intestine of the calf. Uh, that's a general scheme. Here's what it looks like in a little more detail. The idea is when the calf or the cow interacts with the pathogen, you'll see the experimental biology over on the left. That represents a cow, and you'll see the organism growing there um, on the epithelium. When they interact, it's protein-to-protein -protein interaction. It's gene-to-gene, -gene. so I have host at the top, 
pathogen at the bottom. They interact in a certain sequence. We took, uh, it's like a movie of what was happening over time in this particular animal. And that's a huge amount of data. But we use the algorithms we've already discussed to try to understand that data, and we found multiple interactions and identified key interactions of where the pathogen must interact with the host in a specific way to cause disease. That means if we delete that gene out of the organism, Salmonella, we would have a vaccine candidate. We would, since it's no longer in the, in the pathogen, it wouldn't cause disease. So that was the idea of how and the, the um, application of personalized or precision medicine for a specific disease on how to interrupt it. And making those deletions out of salmonella is straightforward now, and, and that's been done by a lot of people, including um, a lot of scientists here at Texas A&M and in our own laboratory to produce a vaccine candidate for salmonella. So there's precision medicine applied to a specific experimental model with the idea to generate a vaccine. So efficacy, we have really limited evidence. And this is because of the diversity of the individuals responding to a specific pathogen or specific treatment. The evidence is not good enough, but it's growing and we're getting better and better. Single institution studies. Uh, someone mentioned, can we understand all that data? We need more data. We are data deficient. We do small studies like the one I just showed you in our laboratory on individual animal. That needs to be scaled up at a higher and higher level, like the Obama-funded Precision Medicine Initiative. So we would sequence a million cattle, a million people, and also have their medical records their backgrounds and all of that information involved. So we need really robust inf information to be stronger and stronger. It needs to be secured because, and here we'll go to some of the issues. The cost, as I mentioned, the first genome in people was $3 billion. Now it's a little less than 250, really somewhere around 150 for your genome to be done. Can you imagine from three billion to less than $250? That's why I say we're in the middle of this, but we're really not. We're on the front edge moving toward the finish. This means if, if the cost of treatment can be tailored to a specific individual, it will be effective we'll have fewer visits to our doctors. There's less trial and error because we'll know the pharmacogenomics of who will re respond appropriately, who will not respond appropriately, or even have an adverse response. So these tailored treatments means that uh, the effectiveness of our vaccines or therapeutics or drugs or antibiotics will be much more effective since we have tailored the, re the treatment to that particular individual or subgroup of individuals. Now back to the question, I want to return to the question in the last few moments here, the um, detrimental part of precision medicine or personalized medicine. How can it, uh, what are some of the deficiencies or side effects or, or detractions from using personalized medicine in the future? And some of this is related to ethics. It's who will own your genomic data, your sequence, who will own your medical records, how will those be secured so that they cannot be used for the wrong effect by someone else, say, to deny treatment, <coughs> withholding care. Maybe I have a medical condition that can't be treated, and so they find that out, and it's expensive, and so they hold my own genetic information and say, no, we won't pay for your treatment. It might, for the rest of your life, it might cost a million dollars. Uh, that kind of ethical question are questions that we need to be addressing and are being addressed at a national level on how to use the genomic information and the sequence information and the medical records in an appropriate way. So consent, you're gonna be in control of that. That at least is what I think is happening now. I know when you send your DNA in for ancestral determination, et cetera, you give consent on how that's going to be used. 
How will it be made anonymous? Your information would be anonymous. Let's say you decide to volunteer to be one of the one million individuals who are going to be sequenced and their data collected. Um, that kind of information needs to be blinded so that no one will know and specifically come back to you individually and say, well, you have an issue with your genome. All of us have an issue with our genome. None of us are perfect. And so could that be exploited in the wrong way? And yes, it could. So I think uh, technically the whole concept of precision, application of precision medicine is going to move forward technically. Can the problems of the, the ethical problems and will the ethical problems, whether it's an animal or human, be solved? I think they will. That'll, that'll be a public debate. It won't be determined by an individual. It'll be the consensus of, our, of the scientist and uh, the public who would make that kind of decision. It will be a legal, a, a huge legal decision will be made. There are already legal ways that uh, genetic information can and cannot be used. Those would have to be probably amplified. I'm no expert in this area. I just know that they need to be done carefully because we all want our own privacy, whether it's on a cell phone or whether especially if it's my genomic information. So yes, that's one of the issues. Patient empowerment. We want to have control of all of that information, this huge amount of information that we can understand more and more. I already mentioned disparity of care where it might be held against us. Insurance companies could use that. I'm not saying they are. I'm not saying that has happened. I'm saying it could happen. And so control of the data, control of the information needs to be in the hands of the patient. So I come back to your questions. They're really a nice set of questions. Precision medicine or personalized medicine needs you, whether it's for your, your dog, your cattle, your horse, for yourself. We need more data. So there was a question about, can we understand all the data? The problem with understanding all the data is we don't have enough. The more data we have, the better the algorithms and the computational analysis is, the more we can understand, the more precise we can be. So larger data sets in clinical trials is what we need. We need physicians and veterinarians with um, a lot of um, genetic background and expertise. It's just a part of medicine like surgery or like microbiology or pathology, genetics is just another component of medicine. In fact, it's becoming a larger and larger component of medicine. We, met, we saw the cancer, the examples in cancer, the examples in response to drugs, the examples in uh, response to cystic fibrosis. The more we understand the genetic basis, the molecular basis of disease, the more we can use personalized medicine. Probably the last and the most uh, important frontier is the phenotype, linking the health phenotype. That's your complete interaction with the, all parts of the environment. The millions of responses that your body can have with the, the millions of bases in your genome is, is going to be, it's called phenomics. Phenomics and genomics are meeting more and more, but not at a high enough level. And this is where we need for you to be a part of it. Scientists capable of analyzing data. We've already mentioned that. You're going to be part of that, I feel sure. Can we adopt more and develop more and more artificial intelligence to manage and, and predict disease? Yes, I've already shown you information that yes, we can do that, but it needs to be better. So I end up with... Um, really enjoying my time with you, enjoyed your questions and my interaction with you, and now I, I'll ask if there are more questions. I think we have uh, used all our questions for today. That they've been um, submitted. Um, so, and I believe we're about out of time, but we certainly appreciate you being here with us today. We appreciate those questions and the way you're thinking, and we hope that we've inspired you and um, made you think about a possible career or a possible path of education. If you'd like to learn more about STEM, veterinary science, we encourage you to visit our website. It's peer, P-E-E-R, at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. And until next time, when Dr. Malenga talks to us about tick-borne diseases, 
We hope you have a great couple of weeks, and we look forward to seeing you next time.